Good morning. Welcome to the IP Showcase Theater. So I'd like to introduce Ed Calverly from Q3 Media, who will uh, give you a great presentation on video, uncompressed video, and IP uncompressed video. So take it away, Ed. Great. Thank you, Wes. Um, right. Welcome, everyone. Last day of the show. Um, so I'll keep you entertained for the next half an hour. Um, as Wes said, we're going to go through the basics of IP video, specifically uncompressed video. Um, to do that, I'm going to look at both the basics of video and also IP. So um, if, you're, you know, if you've got knowledge on either of them, hopefully you'll find something from this presentation because it will at least you know, solidify your ground base understanding of both technologies. And then we're going to look specifically at 2022-6, which has been around for quite a few years now, and then 2110, which is the, the standard that was published last year, and how that has, differs from 2022-6, uh, and what opportunities that gives us. Um, you'll be pleased to know, lots of pictures in this um, presentation. I don't like text on PowerPoints, so hopefully it will keep your interest. And there's a lot to get on, so I've got half an hour. We'll see if I can get it all in. Um, in the beginning, I'm starting with a, an IP presentation with a big old big box CRT display because it's really important to understand where we come from. Back in the early days, we were driving an electron beam back and forth across a, across a screen, and this thing took time to change those magnetic fields. And everything about that technology hangs over today with all of the stuff we're doing with IP video because television has evolved over that time. And you don't make big step changes all the time. You always do little incremental changes. And this is quite an important thing to understand. So back in the old video days, you, you used to see a lot of diagrams like this, where the voltage represents the amount of intensity of that electron beam. But we, we need some way to synchronize that display in that cathode ray tube to, to the camera that's capturing it. And we did this by inserting big, big analog voltage pulses into the signal to allow very simple analog electronic circuitry at the time to you know, resolve those frequencies to drive those electromagnets. We added line sinks and field sinks, or a much more complex combination of the two to allow the television to work properly. But the important thing is to understand is it took time for the analog circuitry to lock onto those and to then drive that electron beam back to the top. But this gives rise to the fact that if you look at what the video signal is spending its time doing, it's not just carrying the active picture. It's carrying lots of other, other information, those synchronizing pulses. And that gives rise to what we've often called the blanking periods, the horizontal and vertical blanking, which is when you turn that electron beam off. But if you actually looked at what the signal was doing on the wire, you know, it's carrying active picture information, then some synchronization information, and then a really big period where it's carrying you know, not much, anything, not much of anything at all. And it's in here we stick things like teletext and vitsy and things like that. So if that was a CRT, just to kind of equate it to the diagram, you're going to be seeing this kind of diagram a lot through this presentation. So it's a concept. I need you to understand how the signal's progressing. Um, but the thing that I want to highlight is there's a lot of time that that video signal is not carrying picture. It's just carrying extra synchronization information. Now, we're going to skip through color. I could talk to you for hours about color, but really not relevant today. Um, go straight to SDI. So in SDI, we now got digital um, signals, so we can actually replace those big analog voltage pulses with very simple codes to say, here's the start of line, here's the end of line, field one, field two, and so on. Makes a lot of empty space now where we can put digital data. So we do. Um, we call this ancillary data, often hank or vank, depending on which part, whether it's the horizontal blanking period or vertical blanking period. And typically, we fill that with embedded audio or extra things like VANC data for yeah, AFD information, subtitling information, or time code tracks. Um, but again, despite what the picture shows, there's still lots of unused space in that SDI signal. So we've used SDI for many years, um, very reliable, but some bright spark realized that you know, um, off-the-shelf IT switch hardware was getting up to the data rates similar to what we use in video and becoming much more cost-effective than a big router, so why not take that SDI signal and send it over IP? So that's exactly what we did. 2022-6 essentially takes an SDI signal as is, sticks it through an IP encapsulator, and out onto an IP network. And that's everything in one RTP flow sent over UDP as either a unicast or a multicast stream. Now, some of you may think, 
Hang on, one RTP flow, UDP multicast, unicast. We'll try and explain that, um, break it down a bit. Let's start at the beginning. Back in 1974, blah, blah, blah. If you go to the internet trying to educate yourself about networking and IP, just be very careful. There's a lot of old information on the internet that really is irrelevant. Um, you'll, I, I, I researched this and, and saw so much discussion still about the difference between a hub and a switch and the difference, uh, you know, talking about collisions on a network and token ring versus all these different architectures. All of this is really old stuff that's completely irrelevant nowadays. So beware of old information. IP really isn't that complicated. It's quite a simple, simple system. Um, so what you need to know, we need to prepare the data somehow because we can't send a continuous stream of data across an IP link. It has to be chopped up into smaller chunks and sent as packets. We have to choose a protocol for how to get it across that network, and there's two main protocols for data called UDP and TCP, which I'll talk about in a moment. We have to address it, where do we want it to go, and we have to get it there. So if we imagine something like a line of video from an SDI signal, that's too big as a piece of data to send as a packet of data, so we have to chop it up. And this could be the same with any kind of data we need to send over a network. So when we have to chop it up, we often then add, add some headers to that data, possibly a sequence number so we can recon reconstruct the packets later to stitch it back together, or maybe some additional information. In the video world that we're dealing with in here, with these standards, we have a, a standard called RTP, and in RTP we have extra information like a, a timestamp in there, so we know not only the sequence number, but also when it was um, captured and when it was put in there. But again, that's a generic concept that works for many different chopping up of data. Then we have to choose how to send it. And there's two protocols for data sending, TCP and UDP. You can see this kind of shows you what data is in that header information that we're going to put into that um, packet. Um, TCP is very much equate to a fax machine. It connects to another end. It's a point-to-point -point communication. It requires lots of handshaking to make sure the other end is listening, ready to send data, sending data, acknowledging that the data got there, dealing with resending data if it, if it fails, but it's a very good way to guarantee transfer of data. Um, it's perfect for files, so that's what we use all over the internet and all over your local networks for moving, moving things around. It, um, it's very reliable transport. However, because of the fact it deals with all these extra overheads, it's not great for very low latency stuff, and we don't want to mess around with video, waiting for things to be resent for live video because well, we've already displayed the pictures and we've already had to deal with the fact we've missed that, so move on. You know. So we use UDP for most of these standards. Um, and UDP is very much a, what's referred to as a fire and forget um, a protocol. Um, it's worth saying on a, on a well-architected network, it is a very reliable protocol. You know, any talk about you know, losing stuff, you really shouldn't need to worry about that if your network is architected well. But it is true to say that the sender doesn't know if anybody's received it or not. So it is, like I say, a fire and forget. So I've equated it more to a radio telegraph because you know, multiple people can listen to that signal. The sender has no idea if anyone's listening or if, you know, if, if people are receiving the data. There is basic um, error, error capturing in there. So if the packet does get corrupted, at least the receiving end can know to throw it away. But there's no clever recovery. There's no clever management for resending of data. But it's great for real-time streams because there's a minimum overhead. It's really, really fast. So we are going to use UDP. So we stick, a, stick our header on the front of that. And then we're going to address it. We're going to say where we want it to go. Now, if you remember the previous slide, in the UDP header, there was a, a source and destination. UDP uses ports so that multiple things on the same machine can talk UDP. They all have a different port number. And then we use an IP address to say where in the world you want to send it or where in your network you want to send it. And again, this is all IP has been around, IP addressing has been around for so many years now. Um, but again, we stick an address in another header and then we send it. And this is the beauty of IP networking is that the sending is abstracted away from the IP layer so that we can actually transport IP data across Ethernet, um, Wi-Fi, 3G, 3G, Bluetooth, all of these different transport or, or link layers, um, and they all use that IP stack above it. So it's a, a nice way to break things down. So yeah, in this case, because we're dealing with very high data rates for, for video, we're in the Ethernet space. Um, so if we look at those headers, 
I hope you hopefully it wouldn't be a surprise to say that's not to scale. That's just so I can fit the text on the screen. In terms of the number of bytes of data that each of those parts carry in something like the 2022-6 standard, you've got a couple of, you've got the RTP header in there and a bit more extra that Sumpty added in to, to make it a little bit more useful for, for the broadcast environment to identify things. Um, and then you've got all the UDP IP stuff and Mac is the, the ethernet layer. Um, but you can see it's really not a massive overhead, but there is an overhead. There is a bit of a data overhead to that. So we're adding a bit of data to send across that network. I wanted to look a little bit more about the IP address because again, you all probably have seen IP addresses, but not everyone is necessarily comfortable about what they are. Um, I'm not going to talk about IPv6 because actually a lot of what people are doing even today, IPv4 within local networks and lo local systems is all that really people work with. So if you don't know what I mean by IPv6, don't worry about it. Um, but if you look at a machine where you see an IP address, you'll also always see it combined with a, a subnet mask or just a mask, a net mask. And this is important to understand how a computer uses this. And it's all about identifying what is your local network, what is your um, position in the world, if you like. Um, so a computer sees it as lots of ones and zeros. And the subnet mask, you can see, obviously, uh, these are numbers that are 0 to 255, and which it can be represented as eight, eight binary bits. And you can kind of get an idea that we've got a long string of ones and then some strings of zeros. And the, the, the network layer breaks this down into a network address and a host and the local host address. So um, you might have seen this network prefix way of writing things with a, a kind of network address, which, which looks like an IP address, and then slash 24 or slash 16, slash 8 or so on. And that's what this refers to. It's the number of, it's the number of ones in your net mask. The way I'd equate this is like identifying where in the world a hotel is, that's your network, and then where in the hotel your room is. So if you, if you want to call someone on, the, on, the, on another ro room in your hotel, you can just dial the phone and dial a local number. That's your local, local network. If you want to dial someone in someone, some other hotel, you have to go through the local, local switchboard, the local hotel exchange. And that's like in that IP networking. On a machine you'll offer, that wants to communicate outside of its network, you might see a gateway configured. And that's how to route traffic outside of your, your local network. Um, so this big long string of ones and zeros is your, your IP address. Um, I've been picked up by, by um, showing this as a kind of old hat bit of information. Class, the, the calling things class ABC really isn't valid anymore, but it's important to understand where it all came from. Early on in the de development of um, IP networking, um, r addresses were all on the public internet. Everything was routable in the internet, and certain address spaces were reserved for large organizations with large network requirements, lots of address requirements, medium size and small size networks, which is really what the ABC is for. It's, it's a large network, intermediate network, and small network. Then later on, they added certain, certain subset restrictions for um, private networking, so stuff that wouldn't be routable on the public internet, and that's why if you've seen 10 dot or 172 dot or 192168, as you all find in your home, home networks, these are reserved address spaces for private networking that doesn't go out on the public internet. The one that I'm interested in, though, is what was traditionally the class D address space. Um, and in this case, rather than network traffic being routed to a specific host machine across a network layer, multicast is a special case that allows you to send to multiple devices, as the name kind of suggests. There's also a concept called bro you know, broadcast, but um, in terms of data transfer, we don't generally use broadcast for data transfer. Um, so I said with the 2022-6 um, the and 2110, we can do UDP, unicast, or multicast. And it all depends on which address space we use for the sending the data into the network. Um, but if we think about an IP camera, it could use a multicast address, send the data into the IP network, one switch or multiple switch. We, call, we would call a group of switches the IP fabric, if you like. So I, you, if you hear me talking about IP fabric, it's just the, the network itself. We then have a device, maybe a vision switch or vision mixer comes online and it can make a subscription request to say, I'm, I'm interested in receiving this data. And then the network switch forwards that data to it. The beauty of UDP multicast, though, is that other devices can come online and ask for the same data, and they'll get sent it. They'll get sent copies of the same packets, but it's no more effort for the sending device. The sending device is only sending once. 
if this was TCP IP with, with file-based transfer, and this was a file server, and these were three edit clients all wanting to access the same file, it would be three times the amount of work for the sending, because it would be three separate TCP, TCP sessions to, to send data. That's why UDP is so suited to this kind of way of operation. But there's a thing to be aware of with, um, with UDP multicast. It is not just designed for one-to-many. It actually allows many-to-many. -many. So any number of devices can send on the same multicast address. Um, so you have to be very careful in your design that you don't have overlapping addresses. But to avoid problems um, caused by this, there was a revision of the IGMP protocol. So this is another protocol that you find in IP network, but this is a control layer protocol. Um, and IGMP v3 changed some of the terminology. They talked about subscribing and unsubscribing group to groups rather than joining and leaving. Um, but importantly, with IGMP v3, they added the concept called source-specific multicast. And with source-specific multicast, again, a little subset of the address space was reserved for that purpose or recommended for that purpose. Um, so if you see 232 dot, typically that's a range used for this source-specific multicast. Um, but it, what it means is that, that the device not only subscribes to this particular UDP address and port combination, but it says what host machine it's wanting it to come from. So it stipulates the IP address of that, that camera as well. And by doing that, you can guarantee you're only going to get the data from the, from the source that you're interested in. And it makes it much more robust. It's worth highlighting that you know, a couple of years ago, you could buy network switches still that didn't support IGMP v3. So if you're going on the cheap and buying old 10 gig switches from eBay, just be careful. It may not support um, IGMP v3. That's not necessarily a problem as long as you make sure there's no overlapping address spaces. And again, people are relying on big Excel spreadsheets for managing these multicast addresses often, so um, you just have to take care. So here's SDI coming in. We're packetizing it. SDI was a continuous data rate signal, so everything was continuously flowing down that, that signal. But we're now going to an IP network where the, if you like, the transitions between the ones and zeros run at a higher frequency, so we can get more data down that wire in, this, in the same given time. So you can see kind of equivalent. We're not losing any data here. We're kind of just horizontally compressing it because we're running at a higher frequency. So the data goes down the wire. People say it goes down the wire faster, but of course it's not traveling any faster. It's just squished. Um, so this is great. This is our gets us onto the, the IP network. So another important concept in SDI and analog days was referencing. And this is still very important in IP networks. We used to s solve the problem of making sure that multiple cameras generating video signals could go into a vision mixer by giving them a reference signal, gen a genlock signal. So analog black and burst or tri-level sync. Um, and it, by, by referencing cameras, it guarantees that they're able to run at the same frequency. So what, what is 25 frames a second? You know, if we don't have a reference, just like two people's watches never tell the same time each day, um, you know, two cameras will never have the exact same concept of what is 25 frames a second because the concept of seconds is slightly different. But it was quite common in the old SDI, very common in the analog days, to have things that even once you've plugged in a reference signal, things wouldn't necessarily be co-timed. So they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't be both on line one at the same time. So you couldn't always guarantee clean switching. Um, and this is because of the way we distributed analog references and different cable lengths and things. So it was a common thing to have to adjust this HV offset to make sure that things were synchronous. And you could time it in, but often you needed a waveform monitor to check that. With IP cameras, we have the same concept. Without any reference, they're just doing their own thing. As soon as we give them a network that has a PTP clock on it, there's a protocol called PTP, which allows them to find the time. So you don't need a separate genlock signal. We use a net, an IP network protocol. That IP connection is bidirectional. So it's unlike SDI, which was just an output. When you plug an IP connection in, it's, you know, it can do more than just send data. It can find out its reference and things. Um, HV adjustment's less of an issue. It's still potentially a concept that could exist, but it's because PTP compensates for the, the time it's taken that reference signal to get across a link. Generally, it's, a, it's an irrelevant concept nowadays. It, you really don't have to worry about it. You just give it a PTP reference. Um, so 2022-6, reference with PTP is out there. There's many installations now have been installed with this. It's out there. It's working. But it's just a stepping stone. 
on to what we really wanted to achieve, which is realizing that, as I said, there's still a lot of wasted data in here. We're, we're wasting our bandwidth. We're, we're sending stuff that isn't necessary over that IP network. And if we wanted to send it to an audio device, why should we send all this massive signal to an audio device? Hence, you have things like AES-67 as competing standards, if you like. So 2110 as a standard, which was published last year, it's been being worked on for quite a few years. It came, came out of some work the VSF did. Um, essentially, it's called essence-based flows. It breaks all of the information down into individual bits of data, carries the video and the audio in separate RTP flows, so separate, separate multicast addresses, separate um, data streams. Um, and there's different subsets of the 2110 standard that define each of these. Dash 30 is what you're going to hear in the session straight after me, which is essentially evolved out of AES-67, essentially a subset of AES-67. Um, so we've gone from 2022-6, which is everything together, which, which arguably still has some benefits because you know, it's all guaranteed together. So if you're sending out your building over, over a network, maybe that's a good thing because you know, it's all co-timed perfectly and it's all in one package. But 2110 really is beneficial within a, within a production environment because we can break things down and we can send data to just where it's needed to go. But of course, depending on how we break things down like audio, we could carry that in one flow or we could split it up and carry it in 16 flows. So you can see I've gone from 1 to 20. That's a lot of multicast addresses and ports to worry about and keep track of and configure my systems, a lot of typing and IP addresses, and that's what we don't want. The work that's going on in this room and the work with the, the, the industry bodies is all about moving to a future where we can have all of this clever IP video all in a plug and play kind of environment. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. And one of the um, first stepping stones on that is a thing called um, ISO 4, which is part of the NMOS group of specifications. Um, and what that gives us is a way to identify a camera, identify a, um, a monitor or a vision mixer, and, uh, and allow various techniques to identify what it's generating or what it can consume. And there's another protocol part of NMOS to you know, link sources to destinations and essentially do away with the need for a, you know, an old-fashioned plant router. Um, but with ISO 4 in the mix, devices that generate sig signals come online, they connect to a, an, an, an NMOS registry, they register themselves as sending devices, they might find a PTP master and they synchronize all their generation to PTP and they generate flows which are time stamped relative to that PTP reference. Other devices then consume the video, consume the audio, maybe send audio and video back into the network. Um, but importantly, because we've got that reference of the RTP um, header with the timestamp in it back to that PTP, we can attempt to resynchronize and get lip, lip sync. And there's more work going on in some of the industry bodies to maintain that lip sync over the full life cycle. So of course, if we go into a vision mixer and we re-output a program output, that's a new RTP timestamp. And of course, there's then questions about how do you resynchronize then? Work is underway to do that, and that will then be added to the 2110 standard over time. So it's not a fi you know, it's not going to never change from now. It's ex every year it has an annual review, and it, it's likely things will be added to it to make it even easier to get to that plug and play behavior. Because of course, other devices might process things too, take a signal, put it back in, and again, those timestamps. If we start modifying them, you know, you really want to achieve this, this automatic lip sync, and that's what the work is is underway to achieve. So the IP switch is the heart of the system. Um, it's really important to get involved with the, you know, the IP switch vendors are happy to talk. They've got a load of experience. They'll support you in design of these things. Um, it's, easy, it, it's kind of tempting to fall into the trap of saying, well, you know, 1080i is about a gigabit per second. Well, actually, it's a bit just over gigabit a second. So again, if you assume one, you're already going to fall into a trap. How many can I get down a 10 gig port to a, to a device that might want to consume all of those signals? It's not a simple just maths game because you've got to think about the fact there's some, all those header information. OK, that's not actually as big as it looks. But all the other traffic has to be able to work on the network. And if you completely saturate your link, you know, not all of this traffic can, can work quickly and in, in a timely way. Um, so use the experience of the guys who've been doing this to know where you can put, how far you can push these things. Um, but also think about what the data looks like on the wire coming out of each of those different devices. And this is where 
you know, you probably want to go to a trusted vendor who's been involved in these interop sessions rather than just buying some cheap and cheerful things that may not have had gone through all the same rigorous testing because the profile of the traffic on the network, I've just said that eight, ten, HD 1080i is about one gigabit a second, but actually it's on a 10 gigabit link. So is it going to be a smooth one gigabit a second or is it going to be very bursty? And this is four different devices that I, I did a Wireshark capture of in an interop session a couple of years ago. And you can see, in this case, it was, these are all about one gigabit a second sustained over, over time. But you can see there's a bit of gaps in these. And this gap comes from that old analog days of the, the vertical blanking. So it's actually, you know, that's perfectly valid. But this one, you can see very big gaps. And if you look at the scale, it's just peaking at 200 on this scale, which is two gigabits per second. So it was actually sending two gigabits per second, nothing. Two gigabits per second, nothing, which averages out to one gigabit a second. But the problem is, if you put too much bursty data into your network switch and two packets arrive at the same time, even if it's you know, one gigabit a second, if you want to forward both of those UDP streams to a downstream device, one of them's got to be buffered because they can't forward, they can't both coexist at the exact same time on the out, outbound um, connection. Therefore, the, the switch has to buffering. Buffering is a fine, it's an acceptable thing. Even if you say non-blocking switches, that just means they could have the potential to forward all the data at full line rate. It doesn't mean you don't need buffering. Buffering is very important. Um, but of course, if you have too bursty data and not a big enough buffer, you can imagine you can quite easily overflow the capacity of that buffer. And at that point, you're going to have to throw, throw packets away. And that's where problems occur. So again, bursty data is a problem. But that's why part of the 2110 standard addresses that. So it thinks about how can we send data over a network. Hardware is generally quite easy because it's dealing with real-time signals and it's very easy to implement very accurate packet timing in a hardware-based implementation. Software is generally where the problem comes because software generally works with frames of data. And in a frame of data, when I finish processing it, I pass it to a, a, you know, another part of the code that just wants to spew it out onto the wire. Could it send it at 10 gigabits per second? That would be really, really bad. Better to space out and, and smooth it out over the period of 40 milliseconds so that you make you know, a nice smooth one gigabit a second rather than the bursty, bursty traffic. And it all really impacts the decision of both the receiving equipment and also the network architecture to get that right. So to try and help with that, the 2110 standard has a subset called 21, um, which is all about traffic shaping, and it defines three profiles. Narrow, narrow, linear, and wide. Um, narrow and narrow, narrow linear are very similar, um, essentially evenly spacing those packets out to give you that smooth, in the case of 1080i, one gigabit a second kind of aggregated stream. But notice there's a big gap. Every now and then there's a gap. Because that's that old VANC data, the VBI, vertical blanking space, that's still there. Even in you know, 4K signals, you've still got that gap that's hung over from the evolution from the old analog days. That's where it comes from. Narrow linear is much the same, but it gets rid of the gap. So it spaces it even more smoother. But of course, you can't send data until you've got it. So if you're, if you're do, taking an SDI signaling in, signal in and then sending it narrow linear, you, know, you start sending the first packet as soon as you've got a quarter of line one, really fast. But on the line 1080, the last line, you're actually delaying it by another, what is it, 100 and, well, yeah. 11.25 in, the, in, in HD, so you're delaying it by another 100 lines or so. Um, it's, it's not massively affecting the latency, but those who are obsessed with super low latency processing, that's why you'll see them implement the narrow kind of profile. Wide is really the software kind of allowing everyone to have a little bit more variance in their interpacket timing, a little bit more burstiness. And it basically, if you've got a wide sender, it just means you've got to allow for a little bit more tolerance on your network buffering and your downstream receive, receive equipment has to have bigger buffers so it can resequence those RTP streams and get it all, all capable. So in terms of what the manufacturers can, can generate, I've already said if, if you're a hardware manufacturer, it's actually quite easy to achieve um, narrow and narrow linear. But if you're a software vendor, it's far easier to make something that supports the wide profile. If you're on making something that receives data, though, it's the other way around. It's easy to deal with the, the nice consistent data rather than the slightly bursty data, slightly variable data. So you typically find on projects people are asking for things that adhere to the narrow or narrow linear on the sending side but can cope with the wide receive. And that's the, that's the way to guarantee the most 
you know, likelihood of success in your system. So that's everything I've got to cover. Um, hopefully I've not glossed over too much. You can imagine I could have gone on for hours about all this stuff, but hopefully that's giving you a bit of a grounding. Um, if you want to know any more, let me know. And I finish with this, which I've shamelessly plagiarized from Andy, Andy Rayner from Nevion because I just love it so much, and he'll give you a nice spiel about you know, inter-packet timing and avoiding collisions and all that stuff. It's, yeah, watch his presentation. It will be recorded, and, um, but yeah. Okay, thank you very much. There you go, I've, I've blinded you all, thank you.